welcome viewers at home at this impact event of Wednesday, 24 November. Um, tonight, we're going to discuss populism, new religious conservatism, and LGBTQ rights in Europe um, in an event that we're organizing together with Transmediale Berlin and the European media art platform, IMAP. Um, you might have expected, as your host today, Lisa Peters, um, journalist for the Groene Amsterdammer magazine. Unfortunately, she fell ill, uh, and it's me who has the honor to host tonight's conversation and presentation. My name is Arjon Dunnewind. I'm the director of Impact Center for Media Culture. Um, although Lisa is not with us tonight, unfortunately, I do highly recommend you to read the article that she wrote for the Groene Amsterdammer magazine. Uh, you can find it on our website. Uh, I hope we can also paste a link to that in our chat. Um, it's on the Groene Amsterdammer website and the link you can find uh, as of today on our website. So um, maybe uh, another thing that I would like to say as the introduction to tonight's event is the, the picture that you saw at the beginning, at the opening of the event, uh, was made by three Polish activists, Elżbieta, Joanna, and Anna, um, and it shows the Virgin Mary uh, with the LGBTQ rainbow flag in, their ha in her halo. Um, and these three activists had distributed the picture um, uh, in Poland, uh, and the Polish authorities felt offended by it. They charged the activist, um, and first they were acquitted of insulting religious feelings on March the 2nd by a Polish court. Uh, and this acquittal was, of course, a great relief to these women. Uh, they could have been jailed for up to two years. Uh, but the prosecutor appealed, and uh, the three will face court again on the 8th of December. Um, and if you want, you can send Elżbieta, Joanna, and Anna a card to let them know that you support them uh, via Amnesty International. Um, and the URL um, to do this, you can find it in our chat, uh, and we'll post it also on our website. So uh, please go there. Also, if you want to become active for uh, Amnesty International, you can find this information on our website or in the chat. Um, but now, maybe uh, let's introduce the three guests that we'll have with us tonight to discuss this topic of new religious conservatism, populism, and LGBTQ rights in Europe. Um, first, I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Malgorzata Miznakiewicz. She's a curator, researcher, art historian, and academic lecturer connected to the Kultur Institute of Art in London. Her PhD thesis from 2018 analyzes networked art of the 1970s, focusing on male art in Poland through the ideas of political dissidents and socio social and geopolitical transformations. Um, and Malgozata will be with us to introduce to you the work of our second guest, um, artist Liliana Zeik. She's a visual artist and activist with a PhD in fine arts. In her artistic practice, she analyzes social issues from the feminist queer perspective and draws on her experience being brought up in the region of Central and Eastern Europe. She was the 2021 AMAP Emara resident artist at, Im at Impact, uh, where she made the video installation Gently Running Downward. And together with Transmediale Berlin, Impact and Liliana have developed this installation into a web project that you can visit on the website almanac.transmediale.de. And then our third guest for tonight is Sabos Kispal, a Hungarian artist based in Budapest. His work engages with the social and political circumstances in the post-communist world. In 2020, Impact exhibited his work From Fake Mountains to Faith, Hungarian Trilogy, in the exhibition Abducting Europa, an exhibition about the political power of myths and stories. And you can still see an online version, including the works of Sabas Kishpal, uh, in the web project that we made from this exhibition, and you can find it on the IMPACT website. So, uh, let me briefly introduce you how tonight's event will be structured. As I already announced, we will start with Malgorzata explaining and introducing uh, and analyzing the works of Liliana Zeik to you. Um, that will be followed by a short conversation between the two, Liliana and Malgorzata. 
Then we'll invite uh, Tsabos Kispal to talk about his work briefly, and we'll have a short talk with him about his work. And then we'll engage into a discussion, the four of us, uh, on this topic of the new conservatism, new religious conservatism, populism, and the LGBTQ rights in Europe. Um, and of course, if you want, uh, you can send us questions. Questions that we will uh, pass on to the guests, uh, questions that we would be happy uh, to discuss. Um, and you can send them to this email address, questions at impact. .nl. So now I hope uh, we've got everything uh, kind of clear and explained to you and I would now like to invite very much uh, Dr. Molgarzata Majniakovic. Hello, good evening and thank you for having me. Uh, I will start by uh, introducing briefly Julian's recent work, Gently Running Down, and afterwards I will very briefly uh, speak about her other projects that I think relate to this very important and pertinent uh, topic of the conversation tonight. Uh, so, Gently Running Down is, oh, just sorry, Gently Running Downwards is a two channel video installation that brings together uh, the legal jargon and uh, political strategies of Ordo Iuris uh, with the intimate language of queer people suffering from minority stress and undergoing uh, the policies in um, and, and experiencing these policies on their on their cells and their bodies as you can see in the teaser uh playing the visual side um the work is produced uh, sorry uh, in the in the in the video you can see a group of people uh, playing familiar yet somehow uncanny games, uh, uh, childhood games that that are sourced not only from Poland but that appear throughout different continents, and these games are are, um, are accompanied by the two sides of the legal discourse uh, and the intimate discourse. Um, just to quickly br briefly introduce who Ordo Iuris are, they are a ultra-Catholic legal organization battling reproductive rights and rights of sexual minorities uh, that is based in Poland but linked to Brazil. Um, they do so in the name of Christian values, uh, or Catholic values, uh, that supposedly reflect the natural law or the natural order. Uh, and according to, to them, to their campaigners, uh, the natural law is countered and violated by a cultural revolution uh, which promotes liberal values and anti uh, and anti discrimination and is claimed to lead to the decline of the Western civilization and as such Ordo Iuris is the protector not only of Polish Catholicism but of the West in general. Um, these, uh, this can be read in their text, Restoring the Natural Order and Agenda for Europe. Uh, which is a manifesto uh, outlining their strategies of litigation, lobbying, and policy making. And mm, some of the more specific strategies that the uh, document um, outlines are usurping the opponent victim status, uh, mim mimicking the language of human rights and creative alternative meaning for words. Um, the political alliance between the conservative Polish government. Um, the Catholic Church, supported by this um, by Ordo Iuris, the legal organization, uh, had met, had many modifications in Poland recently. Uh, one of them is the near total ban of abortion uh, that was introduced in a way that was very much questioned by legal experts in terms of its legality. Uh, there is. Um, Another, another campaign they successfully introduced were the LGBT free zones, which at their peak covered an area of Poland that is larger than Hungary and where above 12 million people live. You probably heard about those LGBT free uh, signs that were introduced um, in, uh, to, to, to criticize these, uh, these legal um, interventions, so to say. Uh, the one last thing to, to mention uh, is in the success of their lobbying is the change of language. Um, so the queer people became an ideology and fetuses were replaced by unborn children. Uh, all of these campaigns have, of course, huge impact on Polish 
uh, life, but specifically at uh, at the minorities they they target most ferociously. Uh, and this is what the other side of Liliana's work uh, speaks to. It speaks to the very intimate, very bodily and corporeal uh, effects and affect of of policy. Uh, I think what's most uh, striking for me is where. Um, one of the one of the people talks about guilt and shame uh, that comes from wanting the uh, wanting this oppression to end and hoping that they can't target someone else. Uh, in this case, this person was talking about Ukrainian minority or other refugees. And as we know, this is yet another uh, a battlefield that is just unfolding as we speak right now. Uh, so to quickly talk uh, talk about Liliana's former works, we'll turn to uh, to a presentation. I will quickly whiz through the images. So uh, these are the works from selected works from 2019. Uh, the first one we see, I think it's coming, um, is the legal. Yes, one more is the legal order. Um, where Liliana created a portrait uh, of, of the organization of some of the members of Ordo Iuris, uh, kind of creating their individual identity and graphic identity of the foundation and their strategies uh, of usurping the legal discourse and defining it through uh, what they claim is common sense and acceptable by the majority, by a majority. Uh, so this speaks very much to a language of power uh, a theme that works that um, is present in Liliana's uh, other work from the same year, uh, which is uh, oh sorry, a well-written act um, that uh, she created in response to the words of current Polish president uh, Andrzej Duda, who asked about the homophobic laws in Russia, uh, said that he would very gladly introduce uh, such laws that supposedly protect children from. Uh, miseducation. Um, so Liliana created uh, such a law uh, and presented it uh, in, according to, uh, along with the commentaries by legal experts and an invitation to the president to visit the exhibition where it was shown. Uh, and in the same year, uh, she created uh, another work referring to uh, the, the narratives uh, created by Polish presidents. This one is uh, titled, I would rather not talk about this at church, and refer it refers to a moment where former Polish President Lech Kaczynski, uh, during his presidential visit in 2007 to Wisa, which is a village famous for its massive uh, Easter palms, uh, talked about the Lisbon Treaty and generally approving of it, said that uh, there is there are points uh, there is something that he that should be questioned, which is a chapter of fundamental rights, uh, and he claimed that there are uh, there are points which may later lead to rights to marriages that are not a relationship between women and men. And then he added, "I'd rather not talk about this in church." This is particularly pertinent, as just today, uh, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, which many refer to, and I refer to as pseudo tribunal, because its legality is challenged and should be questioned, uh, claimed that the, universe, that the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights is not in accordance with the Polish Constitution. Uh, and so that's something to talk about. Another work uh, that speaks very closely to not only the Polish politics, but social context is the Herb of Grace, uh, where uh, where Liana creates a uh, shape referring to uh, a Polish chakram uh, with a plant, Ruta Graviolins, uh, which, is, uh, which was used in many traditional Slavic rites and uh, was used in the transition from maidenhood to womanhood and was known for its healing and contraceptive abilities, but also used in abortive concussions. Uh, and this work was used to create as Leanne said, she created this work to create positive, positive stories about abortion, uh, to kind of bring it within the, the tissue of society and to show how it has always been a part of social life. 
Um, again, this is very pertinent today as yesterday uh, there were leaked news that the Polish government is planning to introduce uh, a national registry of pregnancies. Uh, so any pregnancy will be registered and monitored whether it was carried to its very end. Um, a work that I want to briefly mention is called a fifth column, which is a uh, brooch where uh, which says uh, heterosexual collabo, so all straight all hetero women are collaborators, uh, which is kind of a funny, I think, very intelligent comment on the challenges of intersectionality. Uh, and it tells stories of traitors, saboteurs, suspicions in their enemy and the fifth column. So it kind of placed the proof of legitimacy of conspiracy theories while also being a sign of belonging. And the last work I want to mention is The Red Faced Monkey, uh, which is work that I believe was already has already been shown in the Netherlands. Uh, and I think that the connection with, uh, with Dutch history is, is quite revealing here. So um, the two monkeys, uh, the proboscis monkey and the bold red face ukari uh, were became uh, became char characters or heroes of uh, in the Polish internet in the memes where the the proboscis monkey would uh, represent a typical uh, a Janusz a typical Pole and the bold face wakari would create would represent a typical Ukrainian and. They, the meme spoke to the, the systemic violence oppression, but also mocked the Ukrainian immigrants and spoke to the problematic relations, relationship between Polish, um, Poles and Ukrainians, uh, especially those of Ukrainians who live in Poland. Uh, and this, this, um, this confusion, uh, not confusion, but this unclear uh, status of violence, but also patriarchal care in some weird way, uh, speak to what Maria Janion uh, described as Polish double status as colonizer and colonized. And I think it is super interesting in, ta uh, in the Dutch context, where uh, in Indonesian, the proboscis monkey uh, is known as Monied Belanda, so the Dutch monkey or Orang Belanda, the Dutchman. At the same time, the, uh, the word Wakari uh, was created by the indigenous people of the Amazon. Uh, and it meant exact same thing, a Dutchman, uh, because of the red face that the colonizer had when they were red, uh, when their faces got burned. So um, again, the question of colonization uh, and how it ref how it reflects in the contemporary language and even memes is still quite important. But now I'd like to turn to Liliana uh, and uh, ask you about gently running downwards. So uh, in your practice, you have focused on the themes of visibility and rights of minorities, as we've seen in different works, um, and the analyzing both the social contexts and the mechanisms of public spaces, as well as the legal structures intricate, intricately set up by the systems of power uh, Gently Running Downwards is the work that focuses on minority stress, the physical corporeal effects of discriminatory politics. Can you speak a bit more to that? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Margot Zata. Uh, maybe we'll invite uh, Liliana to, to join the conversation. We're, binning, binning, we're running a bit uh, late on time, uh, but very nice to have uh, Liliana um, here. Um, and um, maybe uh, Liliana, you can tell us a bit more about uh, the works that you've been making, um, maybe also about this uh, physical impact that the current climate had on you, which is central um, to the piece gently running downward. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mongorata, for this really brief introduction. Yes, I've been working on this project for kind of a long time and uh, I think what's one of the most interesting things during the time, during this time, that it's kind of changed everything and the situation changed. For, and when I started, I've been researching far-right language that is being used mostly on the internet and I've seen and I've been watching it go more and more to the center of the politics and that's what happened in Poland for for 
the last five years mostly but it's uh, it's been getting uh, much more uh, active in the even in those uh, last last few years and those two informations that today Maugrata told you for example that that's something that we also have to deal every day that there are new things and new laws and new ideas being uh, developed and put into uh, be put into policy making actually every month every day and uh, that was also i've been also talking about in this project for example a uh, very strong impact on me when i was doing this work it was a situation that happened a year and a half ago we had this presidential campaign then during which uh, this language of uh, hate speech uh, became extremely visible in the mainstream politics and was being used by the president, by our current president, uh, in in his uh, in his presidential campaign. And during this campaign, he said that LGBT ideology is worse than communism itself, for example. And he used this card of LGBT threat, LGBT enemy ideology. Uh, as a winning card in his campaign, and I think it was kind of a turning moment for this um, for this process, and I think it was a kind of a turning moment for many of LGBT community, and that's why also I became very interested, and I decided to focus on this very much in this project, to actually think and see and check with many different people through. Um, interviews and talks I have been um, having with LGBT community, how we feel these things in our bodies, how we get used to the stress, how we get used to this living in this constant state of danger, um, but in the situation that is being sanctioned by the law itself, by the government itself and spoken very open, openly in the media, in the press, in the parliament. So we are so we're dealing and we are living in a trauma that cannot go away actually and uh, that's something that i've been researching and i think um, maybe that's enough for this brief uh, introduction but just i very um, warmly invite you to just go to the transmediala web page and where you can see the whole project the both video channels of the project and also go for the reader, which uh, also have a text that Małgorzata have written about the different context, political situation, and how it impacts not only Poland, but also European Union. You uh, later on in the event um, after Tabol's presentation so we can discuss these issues uh, together. Um, so thanks Malgozata, thanks Liliana, and, and please uh, welcome uh, Tabos, um, so we can start with your uh, presentation. Um, Tabos, I guess you're in Budapest now, at least in Hungary. Um, maybe um, we've prepared a few slides uh, from your work uh, as it was presented at IMPACT, um, and maybe you tell us a bit about this well, a body of work, it's an installation with objects and two videos, um, and we'll talk a bit after your words on, 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 on this piece. Thanks. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much and uh, good evening everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Arion. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, so this is the, uh, the piece actually which, uh, um, uh, according to uh, Arion's introduction, it's been uh, shown uh, at the Impact uh, Festival last year. Uh, it is a rather complex uh, piece with uh, um, yeah, uh, more than 130 objects and various documents and descriptions. It takes the form of a, uh, of a pseudo-museum. Uh, one chapter of it, that it uh, actually I, I, I consider it and uh, <clears throat> it is even uh, included in its title that it's a trilogy, so it contains uh, three chapters or three yeah, parts. 
uh, uh, two larger uh, or longer videos and a uh, body of objects and uh, uh, descriptions, which takes the form of, uh, of a pseudo museum. And uh, yeah, altogether, the, the piece, like uh, uh, even as, as its title shows, uh, it is entitled From Fake Mountains to Fate. Uh, Hungarian trilogy, and actually, it is. Uh, <clears throat> it tries to analyze and to speak about, um, yeah, about what happened to Hungary in the past ten years, which is, uh, <clears throat> I think, a very notorious story. So probably I don't need to introduce uh, that to you. When uh, Aryan just uh, uh, introduced me and uh, he said that uh, I am probably in Budapest, I, yes, I, I am in Budapest. I, I would add uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, to some extent, unfortunately, I'm in Budapest because, uh, um, yeah, in, in, in Budapest we have a system which uh, uh, I'm sure that all of you uh, already know, but uh, the system has been going on for 11 years now, and um, yeah, so it's um, it's been a bit uh, devastating uh, these 11 years. Nonetheless, within this uh, 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 exhibition project, which uh, first uh, has been shown, that's what you see now, the, the first uh, <coughs> uh, documentation of the first show, it's been uh, produced and shown first time in, uh, in Germany at the um, uh, uh, Edith Ruth's House for Media Art. And then later on, it's been shown in many, uh, on many, uh, in many various uh, <clears throat> venues in uh, actually in 11 uh, uh, countries. Uh, and uh, the piece uh, got a certain uh, yeah, popularity, uh, probably not only because it's uh, of its own values, but also because of the notoriety of, of, uh, <laughs> of the Hungarian case and, and Viktor Orban. And um, as I already announced, uh, this, this piece, Fake Mountains to Faith, was part of our Abducting Europa uh, exhibition, uh, kind of showing how mythologies and interpretations of the past are becoming part of contemporary political rhetorics. And I think you just referred to the current political climate in Hungary. Uh, we could call it uh, illiberalism, illiberalism. Viktor Orban also having its influence on other countries, of course, in Europe. Um, and I think what your work very beautifully does is show how these icons, like the bird that we can see here, um, like this outline of the bigger Hungary, uh, as it was before the First World War, um, are now being reused, in this case, by extreme right uh, people, like the tattoo on the chest. Here we see uh, this monument of the bird, the Turkul bird, uh, an illegal sculpture in Budapest, uh, memorizing this great past. Um, what I find particular about your work is um, that you also play with it. It has humor and you mix fiction with uh, official historical documents, um, which also maybe is a bit tricky when, when you have this massive political power of illiberalism, uh, um, an intolerant political climate. Um, uh, why, why, how do you see this element of fiction uh, or docufiction uh, in your work and how do you see it as part of your maybe more activistic, activistic goals in your work? No. Uh, yeah, um, maybe I start from the from the uh, back, uh, <clears throat> from the last part of your question. So it's uh, like the activist work, uh, um, the activist uh, activity, actually, uh, which I was very much uh, involved with, uh, somehow preceded this work. Uh, so I, I, I do not consider this work as an as an activist work. This is more a kind of analysis, and uh, as you uh, very correctly put it, uh, a kind of um, yeah, uh, docu fiction. So it's like a mixture of, uh, of documentaries, uh, documentaries and uh, and fiction. Um, <clears throat> um, the 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 issue of of, of, uh, of fiction has been uh, um, kind of uh, questions many times. Uh, this piece uh, has been discussed or shown, and many people ask me whether I'm not um, yeah kind of uh, concerned about uh, yeah uh, about in in this climate of let's say fake news and so on whether I'm not concerned about uh, the, the, the 
the backlash of 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 of, of these uh, uh, fictitious elements mixing uh, uh, having them mixed with uh, with uh, uh, documentaries and um, so i think my my answer was always been that uh, <clears throat> actually what is happening uh, what has been happening in hungary for the past uh, 10 years uh, was um, systematic uh, uh, let's say rewriting of the of the history which uh, um, which in many many parts uh, it contains uh, fictitious religious fictitious elements so for that reason i'm speaking about uh, uh, fate in my in the title of my piece as well from fake mountains to fate to, to which i refer to political religion actually which is uh, probably it is a very different uh, uh, structure has a very different structure than in poland so maybe later on we can come back on this uh, uh, question as well. Nonetheless, uh, uh, I, I, um, uh, I, I truly believe that um, in the case of, of uh, uh, so when you encounter in the in the uh, reality, in the political reality, uh, a kind of fictitious uh, uh, history which is supposed to. Yeah, it's supposed to support uh, a very, uh, let's say, uh, <clears throat> uh, absurd system. Uh, then you have two ways uh, to choose. You can either uh, analyze it and to deconstruct it, to put it like that, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, to to criticize it through that. Uh, but for that, you need a space. You need a medium. Uh, you need uh, uh, you need your own spaces, which uh, we uh, the Hungarian contemporary art has been uh, deprived of. Uh, deprived of. And uh, so for that reason, I consider that uh, something I would call uh, counter fiction, it might be more efficient and uh, eventually yeah, more accessible uh, uh, to me. And it's, a, uh, I would say, as a, as a kind of, uh, yeah, as, a, as an opposition, it, it might function much better. So for that reason, I'm applying the fiction. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Sabos, for your short introduction to your work. Let, let's invite our other guests, uh, Liliana and Malgorzata, into the discussion again. And um, um, now we have got, given this short introduction to the kind of work you're making, and, and now we can understand maybe a bit better the backgrounds from which you are working. I think it would be very interesting to take this more to a um, well, more general societal level and, and discuss these tendencies uh, of illiberalism, new conservatism, religious conservatism, and, and the, this tendency against uh, LGBTQ rights um, in Europe um, and uh, share your thoughts and ideas of people living uh, in um, these societies where uh, these tendencies maybe are stronger than here in the Netherlands. So um, maybe um, in the piece, as already uh, addressed, Liliana, your, your uh, piece, Gently Running Downward, is very much about or was inspired by how you physically felt. Um, at Sabos, I'm very curious how you have been seeing yourself and your work over the past, well, say, decade, maybe a bit longer, um, in this climate of increasing intolerance, of maybe increasing hostility, hostility against arts, freedom of expression, maybe even the ambiguity that is so very important for art and that is maybe not always understood in a, in a climate um, uh, hostile to art. Um, yeah, this is a question maybe a bit, which is a bit more difficult to answer. Practically, <clears throat> what really happened in this uh, in these ten years, more more than a decade actually by now, it is that I, I totally detached uh, from um, yeah from from Hungary in a way, in spite of the fact that I'm still living here. But I, I didn't really I didn't exhibit in Hungary in the past uh, uh, ten years, and um, yeah, so I, I, there, there was no space for it uh, actually, and uh, <clears throat> so even uh, even this piece like this this has been shown in Hungary. Uh, yeah, thanks to the off biennial, which is maybe one of the <clears throat> uh, one of the cultural uh, yeah, enterprises that still survived uh, uh, this whole system. Nonetheless, it's like um, the the past eleven years has been a continuous kind of um, yeah kind of uh, going down on the I don't know, deeper and deeper, and uh, <clears throat> for sure the the. Um, 
the I would say the contemporary art has been the target at the very beginning uh, of this process. Later on, uh, yeah, various uh, various groups like um, uh, the LGBT groups or the the uh, <clears throat> yeah, the refugees or so on. So it's been uh, there has been a much more and much stronger sort of campaign uh, against uh, uh, these uh, uh, kind of uh, marginalized groups than against the the contemporary art. So the contemporary art has been, let's say, finished in the, in the first uh, two years of the of the Fidesz regime. Um, and I must say that that even uh, the the campaign against uh, the the LGBT community, for instance, which uh, <clears throat> which got uh, much uh, uh, much stronger in the uh, in the past two years, it already started ten years ago. So it's like uh, <clears throat> there is a there is a wonderfully uh, edited uh, uh, timeline of uh, of uh, of this period in Hungary from the perspective of the LGBT community in uh, on the on the Wikipedia. It's on Hungarian. Unfortunately, only. But uh, if if you check that, you can you can see that already from 2010, when like the first steps, when like the new constitution has been prepared and so on. So like the <clears throat> yeah the the the, the first steps uh, has been already taken into the direction of um, yeah, of aggression and and so on. And and um, yeah, so these these uh, uh, so for that reason, I, I don't really feel uh, uh, I don't feel well at all. I'm, I'm fully depressed uh, <laughs> with this situation and I'm, I'm even scared because uh, when you realize that it's such a long process and actually what is happening today has been planned uh, maybe seven, eight, nine years ago already. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I hope this event at least will give you some good moods or at least the idea that uh, people care about the situation. Um, uh, Malgo Zata, in your introduction, you explained the origins of Order Juris. Actually, it's also described in this article by Lisa Peters, coming from Brazil. Um, now, I think it has a particular stronghold in Poland, although it's also uh, trying to branch out into other European countries, appealing mostly to conservative Catholics or conservative Christians. Um, can we say that maybe um, countries like Poland, Hungary, maybe even Slovenia are more sensitive to these kinds of sentiments, this kind of uh, call to go back to old understandings of religions, old fashions maybe, as we would see them, intolerant understandings. Um, and how, if, if this is the case, why uh, are these movements so successful um, in these Eastern European countries, is that a coincidence? Is there a logic behind it? Um, maybe also, uh, Liliana, you explained, do you really see it as a recent uh, tendency in Poland? Uh, yeah, maybe share with us your thoughts why this is now happening in Poland, Hungary, and Slovenia. Oh, uh, I think there is. Uh, there are many things to your question. There are many aspects to it. Um, I fear uh, that this is a fairly simplistic and optimistic view on your side, that they are only targeting Eastern Europe post-socialist countries, because I think in the Netherlands already the questions of abortion rights are starting, and it isn't a coincidence, and it's not coming out from nowhere. Uh, and also, in the, as the Ordo Juris in their document state, they're not interested only in Eastern Europe, they're interested in Europe and in self saving the West. This is the Europe they need to save, so your heart also needs to be stolen. Um, when it comes to reproductive, uh, why, why is it so, why is it working so strongly in Poland? I don't know if there is one answer. I think it is a very uh, complex issue. Mm, certainly, it seems that the old division between East and Western Europe still holds, and uh, the countries were, that, that have uh, a strong religious identity seem to be more willing to follow into, uh, into the more, more conservative worldview and you know, the role of church as, as the value maker. And the, the, but I, I, I fear it's a bit too simplistic. I think we have to also think about um, about the 89 moment and the transformation moment and the way that uh, 2008 crisis uh, hit very differently. So we, there was a recession in 
uh, in the West, in Poland, there was no recession, but the labor rights were very relaxed and a lot of people emigrated. So there is a demographic crisis with also uh, quite a difficult labor market and labor. So that brings a lot of frustration. We have huge demographic crisis with uh, over a million, two million people leaving Poland, leaving, leaving small cities. That's alleged there are no children. Young people are somewhere else. And usually women, if, if they stayed in Poland, they would study in the cities and then the men are there on their own and there is no future. Uh, so there is, again, this protective kind of rebuilding identity, protecting ourselves. So there, I think there are a lot of aspects and I don't think it is enough to say, oh, it's a post-socialist thing or, oh, it's a Catholic thing. I, I think it's a bit more layered than that. Um, maybe it's also interesting to look at how media functions, mass media, maybe television, um, and um, I mean, we've been reading about examples how Orban, for instance, trying to get hold of uh, the media in Hungary. We, of course, all know how in Russia the, uh, there is freedom of speech, but if the main channels are controlled by, uh, in this case, uh, Putin, um, the average person on the street doesn't receive a wide variety of ideas and opinions. So this control over the media, um, the role of independent media maybe, um, the role of artist-driven or art-inspired media, uh, what can we say about the situation there in, in Poland, in Hungary, or what other examples you might be able to give? Uh, well, uh, any of you uh, so, can answer. But yeah, maybe okay, so maybe Liliana. I will. Thank you. Maybe maybe I will just start. I just wanted to add one more thing to what Maugraka was saying, actually, because uh, I think what it's we we need to remember that actually the Polish society is much more more to the center than the far right organization. So this uh, ideas behind Ordo Iuris, for example are kind of marginalized opinions. And when you, for example, check the opinions about for abortion of, of Polish society, it's been radical, it's been more and more radical in recent years, but it was not the reason for homophobia. Homophobia, for example, is not the reason. Homophobia is a tool for political purposes, but it's, it was there, it was used, but it's something that was just used by all the Uris and different organizations, as, for example, women reproductive rights also. So I just wanted to add that. Um, and, uh, of course, when it comes to media, I think that's something we are right now dealing with in the art scene. Actually, uh, the government, the new government came to the art scene in, I think, last two years. It's been more active and um, there are new institutions and um, that are being more uh, more right wing. And I think that what's happening, what's happening right now that we are um, lacking more and more institutions and we have more and we have less and less institutions. We have less and less windows and opportunities and meeting points to all of us. And that's really scary of course and that's uh that's really scary but um uh, but we still have those voice we have still this possibility possibilities so i think it's kind of very different than situation in hungary we still have a lot of possibilities the possibilities that are shrinking but they are still there mm -hmm. and uh, i think that that's something that can be used and that's something for example that i want to use and as an artist yeah um, yeah, that's been exactly my uh, my experience. Actually, two years ago or three years ago, <clears throat> I've been to Warsaw and uh, <clears throat> at the uh, uh, Warsaw Biennial, and actually this piece has been shown there. And um, yeah, speaking to to many of the uh, of, of, of the artists and the organizers there, uh, they just realized that uh, how bad the situation is in Hungary. Uh, in the terms of media, it's definitely one of the worst uh, in the region, I would say. And uh, <clears throat> it's like it has two aspects. So on one hand, it is a full 
take over of actually the major part of the media assets uh, controlling them and uh, uh, and uh, kind of um, uh, supporting a, a, a rather strong sort of propaganda mechanism all over this media so it is um, and for sure that for instance contributes to a large extent uh, to yeah to disinform the people and to to and for sure manipulate the people and whatsoever uh, and uh, so it, it's it's like a process which uh, which is very painful actually it is um, it, it's just yeah uh, the, the hungarian society has been deprived by its uh, kind of uh, spaces to uh, in, in in all all the aspects like not only physical spaces let's say the artists but but the media space uh, it is it is missing extremely badly it's a, it's a very sad situation and uh, so and, and you can realize so sometimes like uh, looking at the let's say state media um, uh, throughout the their various campaigns um, against uh, yeah against uh, different social groups or or uh, uh, or um, refugees or whatever it is just frightening uh, uh, to think uh, through that a major part of the hungarian society still depends on that media especially the rural Hungarian uh, and especially on the TV, for instance, which is uh, which has been taken over like uh, at the very beginning of the uh, of the uh, Fidesz uh, government uh, sort of activity. Um, one one of the first thing uh, this government made was to to rewrite the media law. They they started with that even before the constitution uh, because they rewrote rewrote the constitution as well. But but the the very first uh, step they took was to uh, rewrite the media law. I think that's the most important thing. What was what was the significant change then? Like foreign investment or foreign influence on on media? No, practically. Uh, practically, uh, it it mostly uh, targeted the the governing. Uh, um, bodies or institutions of the state media mm -hmm. like uh, <clears throat> so this was the first step to uh, <clears throat> because there are all kinds of uh, yeah, uh, uh, bodies that that uh, um, yeah, govern the, the Hungarian state media mm -hmm. and actually through through the laws that's been the first step that they uh, they changed the, the constitution of, of, of these bodies replacing people and and uh, creating laws that would help replacing people and so on and then the next steps were uh, were physically uh, uh, buying uh, all the assets uh, through various uh, ways closing all the all those assets which were still critical like for instance the, the uh, there was this newspaper Paper, the Nape Sabachag uh, uh, is a kind of 70, 80 old, uh, uh, 80 years old uh, uh, kind of uh, newspaper which has been shut down, and yeah, step by step, it's been a uh, yeah, it's been a devastating uh, uh, process actually, and it's 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 going to be very very difficult to get back from there. Yeah. Yeah. Before we go to my next question, maybe uh, we can invite or at least. Uh, point out uh, the possibility for the audience to join in with questions uh, to our email address questions at impact.nl at the end of today's event uh, we'll see uh, and uh, if there are any questions and share them with the speakers um, my next question is um, uh, how are the possibilities for independent organization artists by use of the internet maybe or in other by other means to somehow make alternative voices visible in the media scape in Poland in Hungary um, how yeah how, how easy is it um, to organize yourself and try and balance uh, the dominant uh, voices of the governments in your countries yes. Actually, I think uh, the Polish situation is a bit different uh, from a Hungarian one uh, because there is still very strong division between the state media and the privately owned media. They're, they, were they were trying to do some takeovers, but they failed. They the government took over uh, smaller newspapers, regional newspapers, but the private TV is still running fairly independently. Uh, and that creates a situation of actually there existing two countries kind of almost two nations. They don't speak, they don't speak the same language. They live in very different realities. People who rely, who support the ruling party and rely on state TV, their worldview is 
completely different. It's like they live in a different country than those who are opposing the government and, and watch TV. And when it comes to art, I feel, I don't know, maybe that's just uh, my subjective impression, but I feel that there is a, now there is more space for art in private media that they kind of make space for the activist artistic events much more than they did before the peace took over in 2016. Uh, the, the, there isn't much, of course, but I think there is still more, more space made for these voices. Does it resonate yeah. with you, Tsabos, uh, uh, in the Hungarian situation? Uh, in Hungary, you have uh, as well um, kind of state media and uh, private media, but <laughs> but the private media is also in the hands of the state in a way. So that's the that's the difference, unfortunately. And um, so uh, because your your question was referring also to uh, to what kind of spaces of, uh, of I don't know org organizing uh, ourselves or or either as artists or activists. Uh, are there. Uh, I must say that uh, yeah, within the media there is no such space. I mean for uh, <clears throat> for about uh, two, four years uh, I've been extremely active in, in uh, some activist groups and uh, <clears throat> I mean for sure one of the things you can do with any activism is to uh, to hurt your uh, to, to make your voice heard, right, and to articulate certain messages, uh, either you know, through kind of subversive uh, activity or in other ways, and uh, and so that's been a very important, uh, uh, let's say, aspect of our work. So that is something which today it would be useless to, uh, it would be hopeless to do. So it's like, uh, <clears throat> so if you, if you, I don't know, we were doing like public actions, uh, like quite uh, loud and quite visible public actions with police and everything. And yeah, so it's like a lot of photos and so on. But then you had some, some you had a media in which they could be published and they, in, through which they could, Ex, they could uh, have some effect on, on on the people. If you would do that now, it's, it's just no way. Like no one would uh, <laughs> report on that, and they, it would stay fully invisible. So it's like, so that's that's when when all the spaces are taken, and then you, I mean, for sure, you can go to towards like very radical acts, like, you know, setting yourself on fire in the front of the parliament or whatever, that might be, you know, like a, a news, but uh, probably even that one, it wouldn't really get into the state news. So I, I won't do that. That's, the, that's my conclusion. Yeah. Um, Liliana, in an earlier interview uh, in the framework of abducting Europa, uh, we also questioned about what, what Europe means to you. and and. Um, um, I had to think of your response now, also thinking of a question that I would like to share with, with you. Do you think Europe is now responding in the right way to the politics of the peace in Poland, to Orban in Hungary? Um, are they taking the right approach and responses, uh, or would you wish uh, other European countries or the European Union would take a different approach? Yeah, you asked me this question almost um, well, a year and a half I had, ago, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think of your response that you said yeah. somehow you, you felt um, less alone maybe, um, but Poland being in the European Union, that at least were people uh, responding to Polish anti-LGBTQ laws. Um, of course, this is just one of the aspects of what the European Union is. There's, there's much more to it. So um, I'm curious, and I know it's a complex question. I could also turn it around. What, wished, what would you wish other, other countries' response would be uh, to the current um, uh, developments in your countries? Well, well firstly, I think, I think we need the European Union more than ever. <laughs> I think we really need need to be in European Union and this threat of that it's being that Poland is thinking and there are some thoughts about leaving. I think it's the most scary thought I I heard uh, in recent months. I think I think we really need to be together in this. I have no idea what can be done differently. I understand it's very complex politics, but. Um, but I think that's something that 
maybe when you when we are we go to the level of individual bodies individual people individual uh, people for example in lgbt community i think it's extremely important to have this space of um, a little less fear and i for me example of course not only as an artist but of course as a as a member of um, LGBT community, it's also extremely important to have this idea that I'm not left alone. And um, I think it's also it's really important for me that uh, we think about it as a common cause. And I think that's something that is happening in Poland and in Hungary is it's 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 going to happen in different countries. And uh, it's not only about Poland, for example, it's also about this division and uh, and the power play between Russia and European Union, Russia and United States and being and be, we are being used in this political game. And uh, so I have I have no solutions. I have I am. Uh, but I want to be I think I'm a believer in of European Union still. I think it's an important notion. Um, for me and for many people right now. Uh, Zabos, how, how do you see this? Uh, but, uh, I must say I'm a bit uh, skeptical about the, not about the solidarity of the European uh, Union because there is no such thing as European Union. There are countries and for sure there are institutions that uh, host uh, different uh, uh, yeah, kind of bodies of, of, of this uh, political and, and uh, kind of cultural uh, uh, yeah, collective. Um, but uh, the European Union as such, uh, it, it cannot act, right? So it, the, the European court can act or the European parliament or the European council and so on and so forth. Like uh, what and how they act, unfortunately, uh, at least uh, that's been the, the, the yeah, the, the, the in the in the case of Hungary, that's what we learned. That sometimes the the economic uh, interests are more important than the yeah the, the ideals, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and it's a very famous case of the uh, of the German uh, kind of uh, car industry uh, and Hungary and how like the yeah practically different measures that uh, should have been taken against hungary because of various uh, 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 um, yeah, political issues uh, have been uh, yeah, shut down by the lobbies and so on so it's like a complex uh, it's a complex issue because um, because unfortunately the european union it's not only a, a community of, of values uh, it is also a kind of community of, uh, of commercial uh, <laughs> kind of yeah sort of uh, relationship and uh, that makes it very complicated uh, on the political level. So of course it, it started out in the first place as an economical uh, union. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Uh, but I think to be honest uh, it it could be or it could be used of course for also more um, uh, political uh, goals um, um, yeah as uh, Liliana described um, um, fighting against the extremes that maybe in some parts of Europe uh, might uh, become on the rise. Uh, we're getting towards uh, the end of the event, uh, and uh, there's at least one audience question that I, I would like to uh, share with you. Uh, and that's a question for Liliana, for you. Um, and it's, could you, could you tell a bit more about this child's game that you put central? Uh, or at least one of the two components of your installation, as we also saw it in the presentation. Um, what is this game and why did you uh, put it central? Mm, yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, there's, there's eight games that are being played in the video and I wanted this choreography, this movement of the games to kind of blend into one game, which movements which we cannot actually kind of... Um, understand in a way and uh, um, the seven games are real are i uh, track them in in ethnography and in history and i i chosen those games then that they have very strongly 
visible the structures, the social structures in them, but through the years of of um, being uh, being played by children, this the social structures kind of disappeared and just movement. Uh, uh, the movement was left, but not the history. And I added one more game, one fictional game to all this brain of choreography. And this game is actually I, I, uh, based on the conspiracy theory of cultural Marxism, conspiracy theory that is being used very much today in contemporary Poland. So I also added this kind of um, fictional element to the elements of the truth of the project. I want that the, I wanted the viewer to not be sure what is actually the truth and what is fictional, what is this conspiracy theory, and what is truth. And you can read more about the 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 games and you can read some text of the games in the reader that is uh, in uh, almanac for a user chance and and i mean thinking of games children's games they they can be uh both very i would say warm and friendly but also sometimes being exclusionary um um, what, what maybe what does it tell us about how to respond to um, to the current climate? Um, how much is this kind of physical um, connection with people as we have it in games? Uh, also something that we can use uh, for the positive. Um, it's definitely thinking of Corona, where physical touch is something uh, that we look upon very differently, that we have to deal with very differently. Um, um, could you tell a bit more about uh, the, the, the potential and uh, maybe also the historical connotations of these games and uh, um, how you, why you use them and what they mean for you? Mm, thank you. Um, actually, right now I've been uh, reading a lot about trauma and about PTSD. And um, there's one thought that very, came to my mind, and it's about synchronization and playing and the rhythm that you can get with being with other people, for example, in the situation of a game of moving in a certain rhythm with other people. And synchronization is one of the things that uh, that this research about trauma in society uh, mm, is a is a way of uh, over um, um, of dealing with trauma. So I've been thinking a lot about this, and I think it's called also, of course, in this uh, in my work, it's a symbol, it's a metaphor. It can be viewed an, as a metaphor, but I think we can also very strongly see it as a metaphor of grassroots organization and organization itself and that's also I've, what i've been doing for many years now um, one part of my life is art and the other part of my life is activism and i think maybe that's something that i can finish it with i think that artists no longer have this luxury to just be artists they have to be activists as well and i really strongly believe in grassroots organizing and um, just to give us some hope because i have to say this conversation in the topics also kind of been very stressful for me and i feel that in my body right now so i wanted really to finish with some good aspect of the whole thing yeah um maybe before we close uh, one last uh, other audience question and uh, Tabos, you maybe already responded a bit to that, but maybe the other speakers, Malgorzata and Liliana. Um, the question is, how do you make sure your voices are heard if it's not through the media, not through the mass media? Uh, what other ways are you finding to make sure that the opinions that you put in your work and that you have reach an audience? I think, Tabos, you were not very positive on, on the ways to, to do it in an independent, do-it-yourself way. Uh, but Liliana, mm -hmm. I mean, the words grassroots that you're using already kind of point out this, this do-it-yourself grassroots, even if it's on a small scale, at least we can be together and share each other's opinions and reach maybe smaller audiences that will maybe reach 
bigger audiences in the end. Um, how Liliana and maybe also Marco Zata, how, how do you see, how positive are you on that? Mm, yeah, Bagujat, I can just give you the voice because that's what I think that's also what we've been working on. Uh, you invited me for the project that was happening in public space and uh, was organized with a foundation, not not the public institution. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe you can talk a little bit about this. I think for me, that's also one of the ways. Yeah, uh, we created. Uh, as a transparent foundation, we did a project called Artifact, which was about propaganda and disinformation. And it was, uh, we created intervention in public space and Liliana's was, uh, I think, by far the most daring idea that we, <laughs> that we were challenged with because Liliana decided to change, to, to, to transform this 90 meters tall uh, monument built in 48 on the UNESCO site in front of Centennial Hall into a maple so it becomes an antenna for care and goodness and then create rituals around it. Um, and it did work, it was, it did work in a most striking and phenomenal way and when it was there people actually responded and tried to find out. So I think working in this public space, also working in very unexpected ways in public space uh, is that, but that I fear also comes with a very careful mediation and thinking about the language you speak when you uh, exit your bubbles, as I mentioned, those separate worlds. Uh, I think there is this question of, of your audience and whom do you uh, reach and how do you start a dialogue and you know how, uh, what arguments do you use and for whom? And then this becomes this kind of speculation about who your audience is and then it becomes very frustrating and also kind of you know, schizophrenic situation. Uh, so I think it is, from my perspective, it is important to just focus on arts and the ideas and then kind of hope for the best, <laughs> not try to play, make art fit specific audiences. Super. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your ideas, pointing out maybe the importance of collaboration uh, between people, institutions, countries. Um, and uh, despite maybe your not so optimistic view, uh, Tabels, I also take very much from your work the importance of the artistic imagination and uh, uh, that we can allow ourselves in art to be uh, maybe ambiguous, um, uh, playful. Um, and also thanks a lot, Liliana, with sharing your work, uh, um, the works that we've presented in the past, but also still, of course, gently running downwards uh, that we can see at almanac.transmediale.de. Uh, and uh, thanks, Margot Zata Masznikiewicz, for being with us uh, and uh, introducing Liliana's wor uh, work to us. Uh, thanks all also to our audience. We hope to see you uh, at the next Impact event. Um, we can also invite you to stick around and go to the rooftop bar. You can find that in our, um, in our planet dot impact dot nl uh, portal uh, if you want to talk uh, with us or with our guests uh, a bit more uh, that's possible uh, if not we hope to see you next time uh, thanks for being with us and goodbye